Well, I'm going to going to talk to you about a few other ways in which the next few decades will be a quintessentially important period and transformative period. Uh, when I was five years old, I decided I would be an inventor. And when I was eight years old, I remember my grandfather coming back from Europe and telling me in sort of religious fervor how he had been given the opportunity to actually touch uh, some written version of Leonardo da Vinci's ideas. And uh, I saw those actually again at uh, Bill Gates's house. And uh, he described it in reverential terms. And that was really the religion I grew up with in my family, the power of human ideas. So it's exciting to be at this conference. And, but I discovered another idea that timing was important, particularly if you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, inventor, innovator. And then most inventors fail because they get the timing wrong. Not all the enabling factors are in place when they need to be. So realizing that maybe 30 years ago, I, and being an engineer, I gathered a lot of data on technology trends and started to see if I could fit mathematical models to that and found out that despite the common wisdom that you can't predict the future, certain things about the future are very predictable. Basically, if you can measure the underlying information content of a process, it follows amazingly predictable trajectories, which is really not what I had expected. For example, the price performance of computing, going back to the 1890 census, has been a very smooth, doubly exponential curve through the thick and thin, through war and peace, through boom times, and and recessions and depressions. I mean, there was a lot of history in the 20th century, two world wars, the Cold War, the Great Depression, and a few other things happened. And despite all of that, uh, despite all the vagaries of human history, you've got this very smooth, very predictable trajectory. And I say this now not just looking backwards and overfitting the past data. I've been making these forward-looking predictions since about 30 years ago. My uh, first book, The Age of Intelligent Machines, which I wrote in the 1980s, describes quite well the 1990s and early 2000 years. I saw the ARPANET doubling every year. It was really not on anybody's radar screen. Uh, a few thousand scientists were using it. It went from 10,000 to 20,000 to 40,000. But doubling every year is multiplying by 1,000 in 10 years. So I figured this would be 20 million going to 40 million, 80 million, 160 million nodes in the mid-1990s and would be a World Wide Web. Not by that name, but th I did describe that concept pretty well. Uh, tying together hundreds of millions of people, uh, providing access to, to knowledge sources and so on, uh, emerging in the mid-1990s. I saw the chess supercomputers doubling every year, which added 40 points to the chess score, because the chess score is a logarithmic scale. That put the crossover in 98. I made that prediction in the early 80s. Kasparov scoffed at that in 93, which made sense based on his experience then, but they did soar past him in 97. And I talked about the democratizing effects of decentralized electronic communication, that the Soviet Union, which was then going strong, was really doomed because of the information sharing and the democratizing power of decentralized electronic communication. And I think that's what happened in the 91 coup against Gorbachev. And I did have the occasion to share that with uh, Gorbachev uh, a couple of years ago at lunch. And he said, yes, yes, that's what happened. Uh, I figured anything that would uh, put down Yeltsin would, uh, would get a strong uh, response. Because if you remember, the photo op was Yeltsin standing on a tank. But it was really the clandestine network of decentralized communication, fax machines, early forms of email using teletype machines that kept everybody in the know and broke the back of the, of the centralized control of information. And this has also been very democratizing in terms of the tools of creativity. Now, a couple of kids can go into space, or they can write a new web browser on their $1,000 laptops and create a company worth $150 billion today. Or a, couple, a you know, kid in her dorm room can create a full-length motion picture with a $600 HD camera and her PC. So the tools of creativity are really in all of our hands. And what these uh, formulas or, or uh, predictable trajectories tell us is that the power of information technology, its price performance, its capacity, its bandwidth, is growing exponentially. Right now, it's doubling in less than a year. That rate of doubling is, in fact, itself getting faster. It took three years to double the price performance of computing in 1900, two years in 1950, 
it was 12 months in the year 2000, it's now down to 11 months, even just one level of exponential growth, doubling every year is multiplying by 1,000 in 10 years, a million in 20 years, a billion in 30 years. When, when I was a student at MIT, they had one computer which took up a whole building, and the computer in your cell phone today is a million times smaller, a million times cheaper, and a thousand times more powerful. That's a billion-fold increase since I went to MIT. That, that was 40 years ago. Uh, we'll make another billion-fold increase, and also 100,000-fold shrinking in size in the next 25 years, as formidable as information technology is already. And it's not just computers or communications. It's, it's, it's going to affect everything we care about. Solar energy is going to get far more efficient because of the exponential growth of the efficiency of, of solar panels. Uh, our ability to reprogram the software that's running in our bodies, which is outdated, and that will be the topic of my talk tomorrow, is growing exponentially. We can simulate, we can model biological processes as information processes. And these, these genes, which basically evolved thousands of years ago when conditions are quite different, we now have the ability to, to reprogram, just the way you reprogram the software on your handheld computers. Uh, we can turn genes off with RNA interference. We can add new genes with new forms of gene therapy. And these technologies, which are now formative, will be a 1,000 times more powerful in 10 years, a million times more powerful in 20 years. And we really will have the ability to reprogram this outdated software and radically extend human longevity. So all the more reason to you know, keep track of your health the old-fashioned way for a little bit longer so we can take advantage of, of that process. So I want to give you one example of how I've applied this to my own technology work. Uh, I have used these uh, prediction tools to write books and talk about what the future will be like in 10 or 20 years. So we can invent with the technologies of the 2020s. We can't build those machines now, but we can envision them, imagine them, and, and write about them and, and dialogue about their implications. But technology is moving so quickly now that even the four, five, six year horizon of technology projects uh, is sufficient uh, that the world will be a very different place in a short period of time. So I've been involved for about 30 years in reading machines for the blind. 1976, I introduced this. It was the size of a washing machine. It was the world's first print-to-speech reading machine. And it could read, but it was very expensive and it had limitations, and it was quite large. And it got smaller over the years, but it was in 2002, it was still a device that sat on your desk. And so at technology disabilities conferences, I would talk about someday a blind person will be able to take a device out of their pocket and read signs on the wall, handouts at meetings like this one, menus, ATM bank displays, and read all the print as they go through the through the uh, day, including and also dyslexic individuals. So in 2002, the head of the National Federation of the Blind, Dr. Mark Maurer, said, well, Ray, you've been talking about this for years. When is this going to be feasible? And I said, well, according to our models of digital camera technology, pocket computer technology, cell phone technology, we'll have the requisite hardware in six years, 2008. He said, OK, what about the software? And I said, well, we have to do more than just put optical character recognition and speech synthesis into the pocket computer. We need a new layer of software because as the blind person holds the device, there's three different levels of tilt and rotation that we have to accommodate for. There's uneven illumination. You don't have the control of the illumination of a scanner. You have curved images. You have strange background images. I mentioned seven or eight vagaries of real world images taken by a blind person holding a device in the air. And he said, all right, well, how long will that take? And I said, six years. So he said, OK. Uh, let's get started. So we started on a joint venture in 2002 uh, to develop a pocket-sized reading machine for the blind, which I'm holding here. And uh, sure enough, uh, second quarter of this year, the requisite hardware became available. A little bit to my surprise, we actually got the software done on time. And uh, this KNFB reading uh, machine was introduced uh, a few months ago. There's now about 1,000 blind guys and gals and dyslexic individuals uh, taking pictures of signs on the wall and handouts at meetings and, and reading all the print as they go through the day. Taking picture. And it has an elaborate mode that actually guides taking the blind picture person. Taking picture failed. Telling Complex them if background. Or if try restarting the application. Let's 
try that again. Settings loaded. Ready. View finder. Taking picture. It will guide the blind person as to picture where the picture failed. Is. Complex background, or try restarting the application. Uh, let me reload the application. Hello, I'm the KNR Theory to Mobile. Button. Settings loaded. View finder on. Taking picture. Reprocessing picture in books, articles, and labels format. Camera is one degrees counterclockwise. It will relative rotate to the page. any amount of rotation. Calling all idealists. Welcome, and for many of you, welcome. Back to our annual worship at the altar of the big idea. Three days and nights of stimulation, illumination, and fun each year. We strive to help you refine your understanding of the world with it. Processing cancelled. Ready. So in preparing for this, I picked up this uh, document. View finder on. This will read in three different languages, seven languages. Taking picture. Reprocessing picture in books, articles, and labels format. Camera is two degrees counterclockwise relative to the page. Friends, an article the Wicked Six Dia, Fensidope Six Diliber, La France, Lula R6, Public Friend Eyes, or Less Usages for Dolls, Gaston Face Don't. Cat processing. Processing cancelled. Ready. View finder on. Taking picture. Reprocessing picture in books, articles, and labels format. Camera is two degrees counterclockwise relative to the page. Text cut off on bottom. Friends, an article the Wikipedia, I Encyclopedia Libre, La France, Lula R6, Public Fran, Eyes for Less Usages Officials, Gaston Face Don't, La M6 Triple Situ in Europe, DIOS, Equian Club, Beta Reports, Cancelling, please wait. Processing cancelled. View finder on. Taking picture. Reprocessing picture in books, articles, and labels format. Camera is one degrees counterclockwise relative to the page. France. Un article de Wikipédia, l'Encyclopédie Libre. La France, ou la République française, pour les usages officiels, est un pays dont la métropole se situe en Europe de l'Ouest et qui inclut des territoires à divers endroits du globe. La France est membre. So that's reading this French document. Translating, please wait. Translation. Oh, translation. Button. France. 
from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. So I just asked it to translate France, that now French into English. Republic, for official purposes, is a country whose city is located in Western Europe, which includes territories at various places in the globe. France is a member of the European Union. Of all the major European states, it is the oldest established. So that's reading a French Pardon. document but coming out in English. And since I know you like to have uh, first here at Idea City, this was the first time this has ever been demonstrated to uh, read a document in one language and have it come out in another. So, and other people have, have noticed, hey, you can actually do this now in a, in a cell phone. And so they're starting to develop this. And, it, and perhaps they'll be more efficient than we were and won't take six years, but uh, we do have a jump on the market because we were able to anticipate where technology would be several years hence. And th the world changes now quite dramatically. I mean, 2002, six years ago, most people didn't use search engines. I mean, imagine life without search engines. That sounds like ancient history. That was only six years ago. So the pace of change is accelerating. And, and in fact, I've measured this. It's doubling every decade. Uh, the telephone took 50 years to be adopted by a quarter of the U.S. population. Cell phone did that in seven years. Telephone, radio, television, they, those technologies took decades to be adopted by a mass audience, a quarter of the population. Cell phone, mobile phone, the web did that in just a few years' time. And I have a whole theory on evolution as to why this is the case. And I don't have time to describe it in detail, but basically evolution evolves a capability adopts that capability, and so the next stage goes more quickly. It took a billion, this is a double logarithmic graph on the x-axis, it's how many years ago this particular paradigm shift took place in powers of 10. On the y-axis, how many years it took for that paradigm shift to be adopted in powers of 10. So the first paradigm shift, basically the evolution of DNA and information backbone that could guide evolution, took a billion years. But then biological evolution used it ever since, so the next stage, the, the Cambrian explosion went 100 times faster, took only 10 million years, and biological evolution kept accelerating. Homo sapiens evolved in only a few hundred thousand years, really a blink of an eye in biological evolutionary terms. And there's actually only three simple genetic changes that distinguish us from our primate ancestors. We have a larger skull to incorporate a bigger brain, more of the brain's devoted to the cerebral cortex, so we can do abstract reasoning, uh, we can do what-if experiments in our mind. What if I took that stone and that stick and tied them together? I could extend my leverage. And we have an opposable appendage that actually works well. Other primates actually are not designed very well. They don't have a power grip. They don't have fine motor coordination. We really could change the world. And then we always use the latest technology to create the next. So the first stage of technology, stone tools, wheel, fire, took tens of thousands of years, a little bit faster than the hundreds of thousands of years it took to evolve our species. And then technology has evolved uh, ever since. Now, some people criticized this and said, well, curves will only put points on the graph if they fit on the straight line. So I took 15 different lists, including Carl Sagan's Cosmic Calendar, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, American Museum of Natural History, a dozen other lists. And there is some disagreement, but there's a very clear trend line. Uh, nobody thinks the internet took a million years. The nobody thinks the Cameron explosion took 10 years. Uh, there's a, you know, not much happened in a million years, a billion years ago. There's been a clear acceleration in both biological and technological evolution, with the technological evolution emerging smoothly from the biological evolution that created the technolo technology creating species. And people think linearly, and I think that's hardwired when we were walking through the savanna uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, we saw something coming at us through the corner of our eye. We made a linear projection where that would be uh, in, a, in 20 seconds, and that served our purposes quite well. Uh, so we actually have predictors. That's what intelligence is all about, built into our brain, but they're linear. Uh, but in fact, uh, technology progress, particularly when it has to do with information, is exponential. And there's quite a difference. They actually look the same. They are, they are confused early on. In fact, exponential growth can be sublinear for a while, but ultimately, it diverges quite radically. And information technology is doubling now in less than a year. Uh, here I put 49 famous computers on this graph going back to the 1890 census. 
through five different paradigms. Moore's law is not equivalent to this progression. That's the fifth paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. Uh, there was four before that, uh, we, electromechanical calculators, relay-based computers, vacuum tubes. And another objection to these ideas, which, which Jill alluded to earlier, is that every exponential runs out of steam. It runs out of resources. And that's true. These specific paradigms run out of resources. But what happens is that creates research pressure to create the next paradigm. So in the 50s, they were shrinking vacuum tubes, every year making them smaller and smaller to keep this going. That ran out of steam. They couldn't shrink the vacuum tubes anymore and keep the vacuum. And that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes. It was not the end of the exponential growth of computing. We went to the fourth paradigm. And then the fifth, which was Moore's law, the shrinking of, of sizes on an integrated circuit, there have been regular predictions that that was going to come to an end. Uh, in, the first predictions by Gordon Moore himself was 2002. Uh, Intel now says 2022. By that time, the key features will be four nanometers, about 20 carbon atoms. We won't be able to shrink them anymore. And that will be the end of Moore's law. But that won't be the end of this exponential growth of computing. We'll go to the sixth paradigm, three-dimensional molecular computing. That was a radical suggestion when I wrote about it in my 1999 book, The Age of Virtual Machines. It's now very much a mainstream view if you talk to the Intel scientists. And, uh, I mean, look, look at this progression here of transistor prices. Uh, I mean, this, this represents billions fold of price performance improvement on this logarithmic graph. But what's even more amazing, uh, I mean, we went from one transistor for a dollar to, uh, to 10 million per dollar in, in 19, uh, 2002. It's now 300 million per dollar. But look at how predictable and smooth and inexorable a progression that is. Now, it looks like it's the output of some tabletop experiment or some government mandated program, but this is actually <laughs> the result of the innovation and competition of all of you and, and uh, millions of other people around the world, and it produces this very predictable progression. And as we've made them cheaper, they're actually faster, so the cost of a transistor cycle has come down by half. Uh, so that's actually 50% deflation for electronics. It's also true of every form of information, whether you're talking about genetic sequencing or brain data. Uh, no matter if you can measure the information content, it has a 50% deflation rate. That is, in fact, what's keeping inflation in check. And the economists worry about deflation. You know, if we have 50% deflation and ultimately the whole economy will be information, we're going to have massive shrinking of the economy because people aren't going to double their consumption year after year. But actually, we more than double our consumption. We've had 18% growth in constant dollars for every form of information technology for the last 50 years, despite the fact that you can get more of it every year, uh, for twice as much every year for the same amount of money. And the reason is, as price performance reaches certain levels, whole new applications explode on the landscape, like, like going to the moon or any other application. People didn't buy iPods for $10,000, which is what it would have cost 15 years ago. And tomorrow, this is a good place for me to stop. I will talk about how this actually applies to reprogramming our bodies and the outdated software that we walk around with. We're not stuck with it. We can actually turn genes off. We can add new genes. We can reprogram who we are, not just for babies, but, but what I'm much more interested in is reprogramming the software for baby boomers. And, uh, and this will be a mature technology 10 or 15 years from now. Uh, and we'll, we've been adding three months a year to human life expectancy, but that's going to go into high gear uh, when we get to the mature phase of this biotechnology revolution. And that will then lead to the nanotechnology revolution, which will provide us even more powerful tools. Thank you very much.